First, we're going to cover all the panic attacks Joel has in this episode. Trigger warning, if you've had panic attacks in the past, these scenes might remind you of those. Three of the main reasons somebody has a panic attack is number one, the body thinks that there is an immediate threat. Number two, the body thinks there's going to be a future threat. Or number three, the body sees something in the present that reminds it from the past that didn't go well. And Joel experiences each of those three causes in this episode. Also, another realistic component to these panic attacks is each of his attacks have a different mix of symptoms. And that's just how it is in real life. Usually a panic attack will have a different mix of symptoms each time you have one. Joel? Joel? Joel, are you okay? Joel? Shut up. Holy shit, are you dying? Okay, okay. okay. I'm fine. No, no, but are you? That first one got caused because he just finished up this conversation about what's going to happen as they go farther west with the whole river of death thing. Joel has become a whole lot more attached to Ellie. He's become more afraid that he might let her down. And so any threat, any future threat is affecting him a lot differently than it used to, especially than it used to when it was just him alone, him with Tommy or him with Tess. Now with Ellie, she has definitely become more than just cargo. And so his body is responding to that and it's setting off the alarm signals because that's what a panic attack is. It's your body telling you, hey, something's not safe. You need to do something. You need to fight this thing. You need to run away from it. You need to freeze. And so all the physical symptoms go along with what your body thinks it needs to happen. Both of those symptoms are really common. The blood rushing away from different parts of your body causes your head to get dizzy and really start to spin. So staying upright is, is just too much. You have to lean on something stable. The other part of it is hearing. Everything just starts to spin in your brain when you have a panic attack. Every other part unnecessary part of your sensory system just goes offline. So sometimes your body thinks you don't need to hear, you just need to check your internal organs for potential injury. So your body just decides to shut down the ears. That's what happens in this moment. He's hearing the ringing, even though Ellie is saying words at first, all he can hear is just a, a quiet murmur of her words. Then, of course, as he starts to gather himself, he starts to get a little bit more balanced. Then the sounds start coming back to him. But that initial hit of a panic attack, it really can just come on out, almost out of nowhere. Then he experiences probably the top two most common symptoms of a panic attack. His breathing gets heavier, gets faster, gets shorter. And also his heart rate just skyrockets through the roof. You can see him even reaching for his chest. And by the way, if you're ever around somebody having a panic attack, don't ever handle it the way that Ellie handled it. She did everything wrong. She was asking him, is he going to be okay? Joel was the one having to comfort himself. She was talking about herself and how his panic attack affected her. Please don't ever do that. Flip it to where you become the comforter. You tell the person they're going to be okay. Here's a couple other tips. Get eye contact with them. Make physical contact with them, whether that's holding their hand, hands on their shoulders, whatever it takes to ground them in the moment. Also, help them change the temperature of their skin. In this moment, she could have actually picked up some snow and helped him by putting it on the back of his neck. So if you have something cold to hand somebody that's having a panic attack, that can help ground them in the present moment too. The, the change of temperature on the skin kind of changes the channel or kind of interrupts that panic for a minute. The second panic attack is caused by the immediate threat of the guns pointed in their face and the dog. And in this one, he's got the ear ringing thing going on again, but the main symptom he experiences this time is freeze. And he doesn't want to freeze. He obviously wants to take action. He's been a man of action, a rescuer all the way up through the series. But in this moment, he can't help it. See, there's a part of your body system in your nervous system called neuroception. And neuroception, its only job is to, to decide if you're safe or not. If this thing that you're faced with is going to be a threat or not. And if it decides that it's a threat, you really don't have any control over what it does. It is thinking separately from your logic brain. So neuro neuroception decides this is not safe. Here is the best way to handle it. It decides in a millisecond how to handle the, the opposing threat. So if it thinks that fighting the threat is the best alternative, you're immediately going into fight mode. If it thinks that running away from the threat, if it thinks that's the best, you're immediately going to run away or flee. Or if it thinks freezing is the best way to de-escalate this threat or to survive this threat, that's exactly what you're going to do. You're going to freeze. It's the immediate automatic reaction your body has to stress. And it takes you a few seconds, even longer sometimes to actually come back online in your logical part of your brain and decide, is this actually what I want to do? Your body takes over. Joel's body took over. He didn't have a choice but to freeze for a few seconds. Just because life stopped for you doesn't mean it has to stop for me. 
This third panic attack Joel has was really caused by the intense conversation he had with Tommy. They were talking about hard things, especially talking about losing his daughter and also the fears that he has about going forward and potentially letting Ellie down. So all the memories surrounding Sarah's death combined with this intense conflict he just had verbally with Tommy, that makes him start to remember losing him earlier in his life, losing him the first time. So those two moments from the past got brought into the present moment, that already intense conversation between he and Tommy. And here's the thing, the nervous system doesn't know time. So it has no idea that 20 years have passed between those horrific moments, those PTSD moments, and this present conversation. So to the body, it's all happening at once. So it makes perfect sense that as soon as Joel walks out of that building, this happens. He had some similar symptoms going on, the balance, the shortness of breath, the increased heart rate, hand over the heart, having to lean on the pole for balance. All those were common, but this time, did you notice how much he was blinking? Part of that stress response of a panic attack is getting you ready to take action, and that means the blood flow starts moving to different parts of your body that it thinks it's gonna need them the most. A lot of times, the blood moves away from the head. That can explain some of the dizziness. That can also explain the blurry vision that you see him have in that scene when it showed the camera from behind him to see what he's seeing. So he's blinking a lot to try to get oriented, to try to get his vision back. And panic attacks are already surreal and disorienting. And then Joel's, of course, gets even worse when he sees somebody who looks like Sarah. The second major psychological component of the episode is when Joel tells Tommy about these panic attacks, even though he doesn't use that word, doesn't even know to call him that. But it's the first time that he starts to acknowledge his PTSD. And then he says this. I have dreams. Every night. What kind of dreams? I don't know. I can't remember. I just know it when I wake up. Lost our dreams are one of the ways our body tries to process the trauma that's happened to us in the past. And as much as we try to push it down or ignore it, or even as much as we try to work on it and really process it when we're awake, there's just certain parts of our brain that can only process when we're asleep. And for a while, Joel apparently didn't have those dreams, but more the more he has gotten close to Ellie and the more he has basically started to acknowledge that she is now his daughter, the more these dreams have started to happen because those past events with Sarah have gone unprocessed. And when we sleep, sometimes that's the only chance our brain really has of dealing with the trauma. When your dreams have a constant theme to them, that's usually a message to you. And Joel's themes of his dreams are loss. And his biggest loss of his life is Sarah. And he blames himself as the reason for that loss. I just know it when I wake up. I've lost something. I'm failing in my sleep. It's all I do. It's all I've ever done. It's failed again and again. You want me to take her? I'm just going to get her killed. I know it. I know it. I have to leave her. And he can't bear to go through a loss again. At the same time, he's seeing himself inaccurately, and that's a common trauma response. Again, trauma looks at past painful events and tries to keep them from happening again. So it has this filter of seeing everything that was negative, seeing any mistakes, anything that you would want to do differently. That's what it zeroes in on. It's trying to help you out. It's trying to help you do something different again. So no doubt in his dreams, he's reliving that moment of freezing it with Sarah in his arms. But now his trauma response has made him think about that so often and dream about that so often that he's losing sight of all the times that he has come through. And that's what happens to all of us when there's stuff from the past. Our protective system in our brain tries to remind us, hey, don't do this, don't do that, all the stuff we shouldn't do again. And if we only listen to that, then we start to see ourselves as essentially weak, not good enough, failure, going to fail somebody else, all the same thoughts that Joel's having now. And the third major psychological part of the show is when Ellie shows us a totally different stress response. Whereas Joel has spent a lot of time freezing in his panic this time, Ellie is showing us the fight response. Maria told me about Sarah and... No. Don't say another word. I'm sorry about your daughter, Joel. 
I have lost people too. You have no idea what loss is. When Joel tells her he's sending her with Tommy, she moves toward him. Even when he tells her to stop talking about his daughter, she still moves his direction at him. That's the fight response. She could have stayed right there. She could have backed off, but she stepped in toward him. And then that fight response turned into a fight explosion. You have no idea what loss is. Everybody I have cared for has either died or left me. Everybody fucking except for you. So don't tell me that I'd be safe with somebody else because the truth is, I would just be more scared. If you're purposely trying to get a reaction out of somebody, devalue their past experiences, especially their past painful experiences. And Joel's not doing this on purpose, but he steps right into the hornet's nest by telling her that she doesn't know what loss is. Boom, she does know what loss is and she lets him have it. Not only is she explaining her experience to him, but also she's trying to keep all that abandonment pain from happening again right here in this moment. So this is also a stress response because any break of a relationship, that neuroception part of your body sees that as a threat. It doesn't want connection to be broken, especially with people that you value, especially people who make you safe. So your neuroception creates the response that it thinks is going to keep the connection. In this case, her system goes into fight mode to try to fight and convince him that no, sending me with Tommy is not the decision. I'm gonna be more scared if you're trying to keep me safe, this is what you should do. So you can see just all that energy, all that rage, and it's really fear driven because of that stress response and almost panic feeling. What other parts of the episode are worth talking about? Let me know in the comments. And if you like this, hit that like button and subscribe button for more. I'll see you next time.